I've been having so much fun today and yesterday to thank everybody, just echo the thanks of everybody who's made um, this experience what it's been. Um, I'm gonna read two poems from Millennial Roost, two poems from A Family is a House, and maybe three poems from a new project. Um, and I won't talk much between the poems because these poems kind of make their own banter. So uh, this first poem is called First Kiss. He was training me to be revolutionary. We spent late nights watching Al Jazeera and eating hummus. Me learning from him what news without bias watch like and an appreciation for chickpeas mashed down to a paste. We were like brothers. We did the things TV brothers did, things I'd never done. Striking out in the night, getting high in shadows, outside cones of orange light from street lamps, day trips to Walmart. He was the only person I'd known who could see a path stretched straight out in front of him. And I would have gone blindly, even knowing I didn't believe. You and I could never date, he said. That was a given. He had a girlfriend I thought was good for him, and it would never otherwise be something I wanted. He'd said that in response to some of the things I did how I picked out produce, other habits. What a strange complaint, I thought. The kind brothers would never make. He was always saying he was an atheist, that the cure for AIDS would have to uproot itself from African soil and a syringe for him to believe. And I didn't know then why that would be so important to one whose beliefs required no faith. We were at lunch one day talking about statistics and world religions. He told me that of the world's many, there was a good chance my faith was misplaced. That he'd laugh, after all, to see me in a hell with him. I think he must have been scared. I was able to avoid him for years after that until my 23rd birthday. I was drunk when I ran into him. I somehow admitted I was happy to see him all over again, regardless. He took my hand and kissed it. He pulled me in, cupped my face and I watched his face come through the night, the alcohol, and the next morning, on the heels of every step of my long walk home before settling on my lips. My first kiss was one I thought I'd keep. It was important I reserve one thing to be intimate, but trading it in made it all make sense. He'd asked me once if I ever considered dating men. He didn't know how close he was to hearing the story, how I never really considered dating anyone, let alone with any kind of preference. I would have told him, I might have called that man a dad or a friend at an age when I hadn't yet or just learned how to spell them. If I could share that story with anyone. Sonnet of Questions. Do you remember those conversations in grade school? The ones about sex? between cigarettes in the bathroom, by the lockers, 
under the pullout bleachers in the gym? Was everyone asked that question? Why did it really matter back then? Do you remember what you said? Was it a simple answer? Do you remember the stakes? How big of a slut? How much of a man? How far did he need to go? How long? That first time, what did I do? And was I four or five? Falling out our father's mouth. Of course, it's in part a good thing. Everything inside it is a weapon. It's hot, cramped. We sit in its open sores and look outward. At night, his mouth eats. It talks and leaves us out of it hangs open for the salted rims of glasses, their liquid contents, the pull and sigh of smoke. His tongue strains, meaning the pink point of foreign tongues as if in a blind slither to nowhere, while us boys dodge them both. In the corner, we listen to the smacking of lips Watch both junctures peel apart and join again on the bed. Mouth wide open to the ceiling, with her folds of brown and pink flesh eclipse us. We hold on tightly as everything unsteadies. The stars in the sky shrink, planets shift, and this cave we've entered in after him starts to sour again. Those vapors he takes in over us. We've come so far for our father, but where are we? The only name spoken is his own. Our father's new body. Lays of skin trailed behind its slow movement. Dark, gray wrinkly strips with hard hair like an elephant's. They hit the ground in splashes as if in a dive to someplace important. But they just squirmed on the ground while they curled, dehydrated. Their undersides red pink with the smell of decay. We went behind them collecting the pieces in ice water as though we could save them. Between our dad's thin words and departures, we were unsure of where exactly inside the body we could reach in and find him. It helped to look in his eyes. Raw need inside them, but still without welcome or gratitude. What skin remained hung long on him and away from his doings? At night, when he turned over scared from the dreams that chased him, his skin poured from the bed to the floor like vomit. In the mornings, he'd go in on the toilet. No one saw him until noon. We'd send one of us in to clean after him but it was always as if he never went. Despite it, we still fed him, knowing there are things no son can get away with, even as our dad's body separated in our hands as we bathed it, the pull of his crevices with raised masses underneath. Us boys look back and agree we must have helped him that little huge bit that was possible. In the last of it, 
the skin pulled so sharply against his jaw. We swore with it we could cut mountains. Maybe at a certain point we always knew we could remove him, but we wouldn't. Less whatever sadness it would have been so easy. Our dad, so little in his body, and the world has to slip with one grudge into the next. Okay, so these new poems are from this uh, manuscript that people like to laugh at the title. But, I mean, I don't think it's a funny title. It's just a title. It's called A Season in Hell with Rimbaud. So you can laugh. Get it out. <laughs> a Season in Hell with Rimbaud. I dreamt I was showing my brother around in hell. We started inside the house. Everything was brown besides the white sheets in the bedrooms. I let him look outside the window, told him it was hottest there, where the flames rolled against the glass as if a giant mouth were blowing them, as if there were thousands caught in the storm, pushing it onward with mindless running save a desperation for something else. How had there been a house in hell and we invited with time to spend? Why was it I hadn't questioned how I got there? My brother growing so tired from the heat, the sweating. Surely we could open the door, he said. Surely, there'll be a breeze. Even seeing already. Even burning himself on the doorknob. His eyes turned back in his head, working his way to the bedrooms, staining the sheets with his blistered hands. And though I knew the beds weren't for the rest of any body, I sat by and let him sleep. Pain on a soft surface. The wind in hell is a scorch green of momentum. You hope there's a mouth you can crawl in, a soft surface or cavity that could hold you from it. There were thousands of bodies running but granted a reprieve from the crowd. I always walked. My brother had gone off sooner into the storm and had always been a faster runner, arms flailing with wildness, fully extended from his shoulders. I told myself there was hope in the disparity of our paces. He was the first person who told me that I stood out something my mother had always lovingly made me feel, something my father denied completely. I resigned myself to the idea that in a man's world, I'd never be anything, even if I'd still be forced to compete. And it was that thought that got me asking when I'd found the mouth, if my brother had found it before me, or if he was still running. I waited by the mouth for ages, wanting to shout for my brother and being afraid to make a sound for the other bodies. I kept one hand on the mouth's lip to reserve it, kept my other extended, and right when I was willing to let myself be unfound, the mouth opened, just enough for my arm to be taken in. The lips turned over me and themselves, creating suction for my mouth, for my body to come in. And though the lips were chapped and the skin splintered into sharp razors, I prayed for Mike's sake and my brother's that my pain wouldn't end before his.
Okay, this is the last poem. It's called A Hit Lying Down. I don't know why I'm smiling. <laughs> Sorry. Everybody that hits the ground in hell will get back up should they choose it. There's plenty of death and destruction, but no dead. All ends are artificial, wishful thinking, and even running. Even seeing their soft resolve lie face down, you feel sorry for them. Some of the bodies are so far decided, and in some areas, they're lying so dense. You do your best not to step on them, but when you do, most times, they don't bother to make a sound. They mimic what they remember of the dead things from when they lived. And the crowds of the bodies still making their way, I have found myself running over the planks the lying make, stepping on the backs of their charcoaled heads, their heads inducing a misstep as they sink, as I further bury their faces. It's the stress of the flames behind us that causes this, that encourages our rapid collective pacing. It's easy to fall. One falling becomes many, and many makes a felled section. But soon enough, the disturbed tide of running finds a balance. And those of us who have gone under, it seems for hours, are forced to be the fodder of those whose timing is better. I remember watching TV upstairs. Upstairs, the entertainment center held easily the biggest TV in the house. Only with the weight distributed as it was with the TV inside, it was even easier for everything to tumble over. My brother half watched, but mostly browsed at the computer. My feet rested on the lower half of the center, not realizing its rocking as I pushed on it. I'll admit, I understood badly what it meant to be mad at a person. I thought, once it happened, they withdrew from you. You could no longer count on them and to make it even or protect yourself, you'd also withdraw your protection. My father taught me that. I remember learning the lesson from my brother, but also the day he complicated it. The TV stand began to tip over, having realized right away I might have been able to escape but I merely fell back and waited to be crushed. My brother, with one arm, pushed it back. I remember thinking, why would you do that? Had you been waiting for something bad to happen to me, this was your chance. It would have made me sad, but I would have given it to you. Years back, when we were both tiny, I remember the same thing happened to him. Only no one was there to save him. I can't remember if I watched it happen, but I'd seen its aftermath. My brother flailing under the weight of the thing and crying. I don't believe I would have been strong enough to stop it, but I don't trust the memory or myself inside of it to know I would have had I been. And I thank God for that. I only need to atone for the present. If the only world is a hell with my brother in it, being with him will make a new one. Thank you.